verse 243. As long as there is something attained, there is so much error rising. When mind itself is thoroughly understood, error neither rises nor ceases. The previous two verses, which were covered in the previous two videos, examined how the notion of a path inhibits enlightenment. Verse 241 covered that most exalted of paths, the path of the Bodhisattva, which is outlined in various stages, various bhumis. And in the previous verse, 242, it was the path of meditation. If you cling to the notion of a path to enlightenment, even to the slightest degree, then this is an obstacle. What's described here as so much error rising. So as long as there is something attained and something to be attained, there is error rising. The whole notion that you reach, you attain to a particular stage, whether it's along a spiritual path or whether it's along a course of meditation stage of meditation, then there is error rising. Now, if you subscribe to the understanding of a path, then you're going to object to this. So I invite you to examine this objection and to consider your attachment to this understanding of a spiritual path. It's what I've described previously as a spiritual fetish. It isn't a notion that you simply cherish, it's actually a fetish, it's got the power of a fetish. You might wonder, well who am I to be challenging this? Well indeed, so I take my cue from the texts and I thought for this it's worth revisiting the earliest texts which describe the Buddha's enlightenment. These are the so-called Pali Canon. They've got this rather wonderful edition by Bhikkhu Nyanamoli called The Life of the Buddha according to the Pali Canon. And what he's done is he's compiled excerpts from it to give us some kind of narrative and I was going to read out this passage, which I read out on previous occasions, but it's always worth returning to, just to make sure nothing's been missed. So I was going to read out this passage, which gives the thoughts of the Buddha on the eve of his enlightenment. But there was a passage just before this, which I think is also worth reading. It's not quite relevant to what I'm saying, but it does point out what the Enlightenment practitioner is up against and it's put in such dramatic prose that uh, I think it's worth a read. <coughs> so the Buddha's ready. He's not the Buddha yet. He's Gautama the ascetic and He's gone through intense suffering without any results. I'm going to read out part of this verse because it not only shows what the Enlightenment practitioner is up against but also inspires us to sally forth. So the Buddha is sitting there and the legions of Mara are arrayed against him. So he describes these legions. Your first squadron is sense desires. Your second is called boredom. Then hunger and thirst compose the third, and craving is the fourth in rank. The fifth is sloth and acidity, which is another word for torpor. While cowardice lines up as sixth, 
Uncertainty is seventh. The eighth is malice paired with obstinacy. Gain, honour and renown besides an ill-won notoriety, self-praise and denigrating others. These are your squadrons, Namuchi. These are the black ones fighting squadrons. None but the brave will conquer them to gain bliss by the victory. I fly the ribbon that denies retreat. Namuchi is a precursor of Mara. I think we can understand Namuchi is just Mara in this case. This is what the Enlightenment practitioner has to navigate through. The Enlightenment practitioner navigates through not only the personal psychology that we inhabit, but also the full force of our moods, both our bad moods and our good moods. I'll say more about that shortly. So the Buddha is saying, by the way, this is on page 20 and 21 of Bhikkhunyana Moli's book. So the Buddha says, I thought, whenever a monk or Brahman has felt in the past or will feel in the future or feels now, painful, racking, piercing feeling due to striving, it can equal this but not exceed it. But by this gruelling penance I have attained no distinction higher than the human state, worthy of the noble one's knowledge and vision. Might there be another way to enlightenment? So this is due to striving. The idea that you have to do something to get something. But we do have to stop giving in. It's giving in that's the doing. Giving in to our passions, our desires, our fetishes, our moods, our ideologies. Because these want to make us do something. These are what are behind our striving. The solution, as verse 243 points out, is understanding mind itself. I'll come to that shortly. So this is the Buddha on the eve of his enlightenment. I thought of a time when my Shakyan father was working. The Buddha and his father belonged to the Shakyan tribe. And I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, quite secluded from sensual desires, secluded from unprofitable things I had entered upon and abode in the first meditation. This is the first jhana which the Buddha, as a young man, a teenager, entered spontaneously. It's possible to enter this spontaneously. So he abode in the first meditation, which is accompanied by thinking and exploring with happiness and pleasure born of seclusion. I thought, might that be the way to enlightenment? Then, following up that memory, there came the recognition that this was the way to enlightenment. So the enlightenment is from this first jhana, which is a very happy, contented state. It's like all the stormy weather has passed. There's a break in the clouds. And you're suddenly at ease. Nothing, nothing's bothering you from the outside. Nothing's bothering you internally either. It's just one of these moments where you're free from concerns and anxieties. And I suggest that it's possible that most people have had such a moment at some point in their lives. But just to reinforce what I was saying about the path of meditation, what the Buddha did after this was, after he'd taken some solid food and regained his strength, he entered into this first jhana again. And on page 23 it describes how he entered into the higher stages of meditation. And the point is, not that this is necessary. The point is that he didn't need to. He didn't need to. He came back to that first jhana. 
This is where the mind is working clearly and without impediment. So he entered the first meditation, which is accompanied by thinking and exploring with happiness and pleasure born of seclusion. And this is the important point. But I allowed no such pleasant feeling as arose in me to gain power over my mind. And so on with the second one. With the stilling of thinking and exploring, I entered upon an abode in the second meditation, which has internal confidence and singleness of mind without thinking and exploring with happiness and pleasure born of concentration. But I allowed no such pleasant feeling as arose in me to gain power over my mind. So the Buddha has followed the path of meditation. And this is what's being pointed out here. He comes back to the first jhana. But what's also being pointed out is he's not getting caught up in any of the blissful feelings that arise. Now, how many of you who practice meditation are looking for this bliss? You want to get into these jhanas and lap it up. This is your response, perhaps, to a very unpleasant world. This isn't the point. The point, as this verse points out, is when mind itself is thoroughly understood, error neither rises nor ceases. If it doesn't rise, it cannot cease. There's no error, and this is the error of attainment. So mind itself is one of the themes of these videos. Understanding mind itself it's not a conceptual understanding, it's the realization of mind itself. Mind with a capital M. This mind itself is not something at the end of an arduous spiritual path. It's not something that can be attained. This is the error. Because it's something that's happening now. Mind itself is awareness. Whatever you might say about yourself. You have to say or acknowledge that you are aware. Now don't worry about what this means. Acknowledge it. It's something that you take for granted all the time. You don't acknowledge it. It is tied in with a fundamental sense of who or what you are. That's why I sometimes refer to as a sense of being. It's not the name that's been slapped on you. It's not the qualities with which you've been described. It isn't even all the stuff that's going on in your head. It's not all the feelings that you have, because these are the things which drag you along. All the moods, very often difficult moods, but we have to be very careful. As was pointed out in the case of the Buddha, not to get caught up in good moods either. They're more difficult to work with, actually, than the bad moods. Because awareness has got nothing to do with these things. This is mind itself. 
the awareness that's hearing this the awareness that might be looking at the video this awareness is uncolored it's where we're operating from every moment of our waking state and also in our dreaming state it's operating whether we're engaged in activities or whether we're lost in a daydream awareness is where we're coming from and enlightenment practice awareness is what we return to this is understanding mind itself there's no attainment here so there's no error and therefore we are finally abiding in truth. <laughs>